Good morning and welcome to a joint meeting of the uh, Vermont House Human Services Committee and the Vermont Healthcare Committee. It is Thursday, May 6th. And for the next hour and a half until 1030, the uh, two committees will be um, hearing um, about the emergency housing proposal uh, from the administration. Um, what to do about emergency housing um, perhaps uh, becomes even more important now as we uh, move, move forward and out of the pandemic. Um, however, uh, Vermonters not having a place to live um, has been a crisis before the pandemic. And in fact, the administration had a plan, a proposal before the pandemic sort of stopped everything. And um, I have to say, I am appreciative of the work of the administration and community providers in um, ensuring that people who um, needed a place to live um, were able to spend time in um, hotels and motels and be safe. Um, uh, <clears throat> rather than um, share screens, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, the, what I understand uh, our, our testifiers are going to be uh, using is um, talking from the emergency housing program. You can see those documents on either the committee webpage of House Human Services and House Healthcare. Um, we have four people. We have Commissioner Brown, we have a uh, Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families, and we have uh, Jeffrey Pippinger, who's the senior advisor um, of the Commissioner Department of Children and Families. Um, Jessica Radboard, who's a staff attorney from Vermont Legal Aid, and Sarah Truckle, who's the financial uh, director for the Department of Children and Families. Uh, Jeffrey and Jessica were on the uh, sort of working group that I think came up with a plan. Um, and uh, I see that um, Representative McFawn has a, has a question and go ahead, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanna make sure which one where you, you mentioned emergency housing program. Uh, um, we're gonna do the housing work group proposed plan. Is that right? Um, yes, and I will, um, I, whoever is speaking, I will ask them to be clear about which um, of the documents that they are speaking from. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and what I would um, uh, ask the joint committee's forbearance with, with 22 people, if we, um, uh, if every five minutes, because I know the House Human Services Committee, we like to ask questions, if we can perhaps um, hold our questions unless they're a question of we you don't understand what is being said, um, but hold the questions um, until there seems to be an appropriate um, break. I think that would be most helpful. Um, and uh, so thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brown, are you um, are you the uh, conductor of this? Yes, I will um, um, uh, uh, start and then throughout the presentation, we'll um, share that role with uh, 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 Jeffrey and Jessica. And then also when we get to the budget piece, we'll have Sarah Truckle jump in as well. Um, and that might be the one time where we pull up the document on the screen is just because sometimes numbers are easier to see than, than to talk about. So um, th thank you um, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I do want to acknowledge the members of the work group um, who met um, uh, for a series of eight meetings during the month of April and continues to meet um, to um, work on the rules and rolling out this plan if approved by the legislature. Um, the work group was facilitated and led by Secretary uh, Mike Smith of the Agency of Human Services, along with Jenny Samuelson, the Deputy Secretary. It included um, staff um, from the Secretary's Office, Andrea Della Brew, um, Deputy Commissioner Tricia Tayo, Sarah Phillips, as you indicated, Jeffrey Pippinger, and Sarah Truckle for our community partners. Um, today, Je Jessica Radboard uh, participated um, as well on the work group, as well as uh, Josh Davis from Groundworks in Brattleboro. 
um, Rita Markley from Cots up in the Burlington area, um, Margaret Bozick from the Champlain Housing Trust um, participated as well, Michael Redmond um, from the Upper Valley Haven in, in Hartford White River Junction area, uh, Carrie Case, uh, Kara Casey from the Vermont Network Against uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence, um, Paul Dragon from um, CBOEO, the Community Action Agency up in Chittenden uh, area, um, Tom Donahue from the uh, Community Action Agency in the Bennington Rutland area from Brock. And then also we had others from the administration participate too. Uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner from the Departmental Health participated and also at times um, we invited was Josh Hannaford and Sean Gilpin um, from ACCD, uh, Department for Community and Housing. Um, and I always butcher that name, so I apologize. Um, um, uh, participated in the work group and, um, and the work of that group is presented in this plan. Um, there was consensus uh, on moving this plan forward from all members of the group for which there, uh, except for one area, which we'll highlight for the committee this morning. Um, and that was uh, uh, one piece of the plan and Jessica is here can explain kind of um, their concerns regarding that one piece it, uh, the, the consent the, where we did not have consensus uh, Vermont Legal Aid and Paul Dragon from CBOEO um, um, uh, raised some concern on one area of, of the plan and, and she can speak to a little deeper of that today. Um, as you indicated before the pandemic we, we ran an emergency housing program very prescriptive rules in place about who was eligible and for how long you were served. Um, primarily, um, and when we had the adverse weather conditions, we would use at, at, um, at its maximum 250 to 300 motel rooms before the pandemic in the depths of the winter. And many times we would run out of motel capacity um, at that when we needed that level of, of um, uh, hotel rooms across the state. Um, during the pandemic, when the pandemic started, um, the uh, administration and, and our partners moved very quickly um, uh, to uh, close shelters. They were congregate settings and also um, other homeless individuals. And we saw homelessness increase during the pandemic as households that were unstably housed and staying with friends and family were no longer able to do that due to health and safety guidelines. And so we relaxed the rules completely and with the uh, hospitality industry coming, coming to a halt because of the pandemic, we were able to access many, many more rooms than we normally would um, uh, pre-pandemic. And we are currently housing, uh, utilizing about not, just over 1,900 motel rooms across the state right now to house um, homeless individuals and families. Um, we do anticipate that that number will start to drop sharply as we reopen um, in July and, and through the summer and into the fall. Um, as you'll see in, in the plan, you know, we have worked hard to try to increase our capacity, um, but we do anticipate like we've been given notice by the owners of the Holiday Inn um, that they are going to uh, 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 stop leasing the facility to us. And that's been operated by CBOEO. Um, and so we will lose that capacity. Other hotels have told us that they're going to start shifting back to serving tourists and travelers. And so we anticipate that our available hotel rooms will drop sharply and then continue to drop through the summer and into the fall. And we anticipate we will only have access to about 650 motel rooms um, by the end of the fall into the beginning of the winter. And so this plan takes that capacity uh, component into account as we developed this plan. Um, and, I, and I would point out that we are currently um, losing some capacities with hotels, no longer accepting new referrals and allowing those that are there to stay until they transition out. Um, and so we are already bumping into capacity issues in some areas of the state. And I would highlight that Middlebury is one of those um, areas we have significant concern right now. Um, so we're pl pl uh, planning on uh, two phases of implementing this plan. For those that are in the program right now, there would be no changes through, the, through June 30th. They would continue to be eligible as they are now. However, for new households coming in, there would be eligibility changes uh, um, uh, put in place for, for June 1st. And so currently right now, anyone who's homeless is eligible 
we would imp we would uh, this plan proposes new eligibility categorical eligibility requirements, and I will walk the committee through those and highlight how they how they look similar to what we did pre pandemic and how they are going to be different um, after um, we come out of the pandemic and if this plan is uh, supported by the legislature. Um, and so these would be for new households coming in on June 1st. Um, and then also for those in the motels, they would be able to reapply after June 30th and they could continue to be eligible under these new criteria effective July 1st. And so that would be the first point I would make uh, to the committees this morning. And so the new eligibility um, uh, criteria that will go into place, um, I'll, I'll walk the committee th through those. Um, just as we had before the pandemic, we will continue um, as a category, those that lose their housing due to a natural disaster, uh, such as fire or flood or hurricane um, before the pandemic, um, those households were eligible for up to 84 days of, 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 of um, service um, it, um, in a motel, nights in a motel. Uh, they will continue to be eligible for 84 nights under this under the new under this new proposal. Also, um, uh, individuals and families fleeing domestic uh, dating or sexual violence, uh, stalking or human trafficking, um, or or eligible uh, for 84 days pre-pandemic. They will continue to be eligible for 84 days um, uh, um, under these under these new proposed rules. So there's really no change there for, for, for that category. Um, the first area where you will see some change from the pre-pandemic to post-pandemic um, would be families with children. Before the pandemic, we served families with children for 28 days if they had a child under age six. Um, now we are proposing um, to serve families with children of any age up to 19 if they're still in secondary um, education and that they will now be eligible for 84 days instead of 28 uh, um, uh, as it was pre-pandemic. Also, we recognize that families need larger housing, permanent housing uh, in general, and those are harder to locate. Um, and so we are putting in place um, an ability for a family who's coming to the end of their 84 days to ask for extensions in 30 day increments, as long as they're continuing to be engaged with services and actively looking for permanent housing, that we will be able to grant them 30 day extensions um, uh, so that they, um, they will continue to be housed while they look for permanent housing. Many of our families have housing vouchers right now. It's just the, the, the lack of, of units is really um, uh, stressing the system right now. And we see that particularly with families. Um, also, um, we will continue to serve households with older Vermonters before the pandemic. Um, you, you know, that they were served at, under the vulnerable category and were eligible for 28 days. Um, now, um, households with an individual over age 60 will be eligible for 84 days. Um, so that that's a change from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. So we're expanding service for these households as well under the new program. Um, also, we will continue to serve um, households, including a person with a disability, including but not limited to those receiving SSI, SSDI, or VA disability benefits. Pre-pandemic, that was a vulnerable category. They were um, individuals in this category were eligible for 28 days. They will now be eligible for 84 days uh, under the new plan. And similar to um, families, those individuals um, with a significant disability that impacts their activities of daily living will also have the ability to apply for extensions just as families um, with, with children will under these proposed rules as well. And, we'll, and they'll be able to, to apply for those and continue to be housed as we look for uh, other permanent or living arrangements or care arrangements for those households. Um, um, so that 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 is a, uh, an expansion of, of services under the new rules versus the old rules. Um, also, we will continue um, to uh, serve um, households um, that are pursuing uh, legal re resolution or violations of the rental housing code 
um, through through the Vermont Department of Health or other appropriate officials. And as a result of trying to remedy those situations, lost their housing, they will be eligible for 84 days of service. Also, uh, households that were um, physically barred from entering their residence by their landlord will also continually uh, will continue to be housed for 84 days under these new rules as well. And so, um, and I know Jeffrey wants to jump in here and add one more piece, Jeffrey. Good morning. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Pippinger. I am the senior advisor to the commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. Thanks for having us here. I just wanted to add um, one thing just to kind of uh, pull back for a second and have a wider lens, which is that to remind people that as Sean has, as the commissioner has walked through these eligibility uh, categories, that pre-pandemic, we had a much narrower set of eligibility criteria and it was uh, that had different days for different categories, right? And there were very specific limitations on what uh, populations, even nuances within those populations. During the pandemic, um, as a response to the public health crisis, we had opened up that eligibility um, wide. And now, uh, as we're coming out of uh, the, the, uh, the deepest part of the pandemic and starting to transition to what's hopefully a new normal kind of recovery, that we are then restricted, we're proposing to restrict the eligibility to a narrower point than during the pandemic, but wider than pre pandemic. So that's just an important frame of reference to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, and then um, we, we're also proposing some other changes to how the program is operated pre-pandemic to post-pandemic in this proposal. Um, a couple of those are um, income limits and self-pay. Um, pre-pandemic, we really used an income standard that was more tied to the reach-up program, which is 60% of the federal poverty level. Like if you were above that, you, you were deemed not eligible for the program. We are now aligning um, the income threshold for eligibility for this program in line with the three squares in uh, Vermont and LIHEAP programs at 185% of the federal poverty level. So that is an expansion of the income limits um, under these new proposals versus under uh, pre-pandemic. Um, also, we um, pre-pandemic, we had um, a self contribution for households with income. Um, they would be asked to contribute financially 30% of their income. Um, it used to be a gross calculation. Now we're moving to a net and, and aligning it with how we calculate that under the reach up standard. Um, again, which is, a, which is a, an expansion of how we um, approach this um, post pandemic versus pre-pandemic. Um, and then I would turn it over to uh, Jeffrey um, to touch on um, the period of ineligibility and, um, and changes to uh, uh, how we approach someone who's caused their own loss of housing. And I know that's an important area that Jessica will wanna touch on as well. Um, uh, Commissioner, before we turn it over to Jeffrey, this seems like a place where folks might have had questions um, for the first part of what you've gone through. Representative Wood. Um, Commissioner, you may have said this, but I, I might have missed it. Um, the 84 days, so that seems to be a consistent thread throughout what you, you spoke of. What is, uh, um, why is it 84, not 85, not 82, what, what is special about 84? Well, 84 has been the, the, the historical maximum of eligibility under the old rules. Um, and we know that households and families, um, it, it's kind of based on how long it takes someone to secure new housing. And I, and I would defer to Jeffrey with his experience here, but we know it takes 60 to 84 days for households to secure new housing. And so that's kind of how that date, I think, has evolved over time. But right now we were using the maximum time limit available under the old rules as the starting place. And some of that's always been tied to resources, whether it's the availability of motel rooms or, or this program has historically been funded with general fund and just it was a, a resource limitation on both motels and um, financial. 
And Representative Wood, as I understand your question, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I hear part of the question being like, why that's why the specific number, right? Yes. Um, and and uh, the, the history behind that, as far as I um, uh, understand, is that uh, because usually we talk about things in 30 day increments, 60 day increments, 90 day increments, one, two, three months. Um, 84 days is actually the three month increment, but in seven day chunks. So historically, when the program was uh, developed in those time limits and the durations of grants, the, uh, the period um, within which somebody was eligible for that motel voucher, because we issue in durations of grant. So that was seven days or 14 days. Um, and then up to 28 days over time uh, at a time at, at, in one chunk. And so that's how you get to the 84 uh, days, it's 12 weeks. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. I, uh, I'm presuming that the work group um, discussed the um, even greater appears to be lack of affordable housing. And so sort of historically, that might've been sufficient to find alternative housing. It um, I just ha have my questions about whether it's sufficient to find alternative housing um, at this moment in our history. It's just a, it's just a statement. Well, <laughs> Thank uh, you. If there was one um, message we would want to leave with the committees today is I think the point you're making, Representative Wood, um, there is a real housing crisis in this state and it existed before the pandemic with really low rental rates and, and lack of affordable housing for purchase or rent. Um, that has been incredibly exacerbated um, by the pandemic with um, housing prices going through the roof and uh, folks coming to Vermont uh, seeking the rel I think the, the relatively safety they thought it provided during the pandemic. And so the housing market is incredibly tight right now. Um, and also um, the rental market is, is significantly worse than we've ever seen, that I've ever seen in my time working in the agency. And so you are exactly um, correct there. And I think that's why it's important that we are strongly advocating for the legislature to reconsider the governor's proposal to invest $249 million in affordable permanent housing for low and middle income Vermonters to build 5,500 units, because that's essential for Vermont moving forward. We just do not have the units now. We have we have so much rental assistance and new rental vouchers coming in from the federal government and we're not able to avail ourselves of those because you know we do not have the units for people to rent. And this plan was put together um, by this working group um, up with, the, with the belief that new units would be coming online. The, the governor's proposal has 600 new units coming online um, this year, has new shelter capacity investments coming online as well, but then also builds out in, in year two and year three additional units getting to 5,500. And that is critical for investment for this state to make. And we would just urge you to reconsider and think about as you approach the budget this year, um, uh, th that that was a critical component of putting this plan together, that they go that they go you know together. Um, thank you. If, if uh, I can add on to that, Representative Wood, that um, the other um, two other um, points about the uh, the sufficiency of eighty four days in terms of being able to access housing. Um, that's that's why you'll see with the households with children there's the ability to extend for 30 day increments. Um, that's a conscious acknowledgement of that, particularly because you know that um, with the ways in which adverse childhood experiences and the trauma of being in motels and, and many other traumas over the last 14 months, um, that we wanna make sure that we can support those households as best as possible moving forward. And then I will also remind folks that on the flip side, um, as the commissioner had indicated at the beginning of um, walking through the proposal, we have very real capacity challenges going forward that even if we were to say uh, people had uh, 100, uh, 150 days or 300 days, that we wouldn't have the motel capacity to be able to house people. There would, it, would, it would create a different sort of problem in terms of people being able to access that emergency temporary housing. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were stretched often in the winter in terms of our motel capacity uh, in many regions of the state. 
and that has only amplified during the pandemic. Um, Jeffrey, uh, in relation to the 30-day extension, um, the language talks about um, eligible, extension of eligibility um, for 30 day in 30 day increments if they stay engaged in services. First of all, what are the services that they're supposed to be engaged with and what does engaged mean? I'm appreciating the, the question, Madam Chair. Uh, I think some of those details will be worked out uh, as we promulgate any of the rules going forward. But I think suffice to say that um, during the pandemic, we have people have been engaged with housing navigators um, through our uh, community partners who have done extraordinary work uh, during the pandemic to support people. Um, so I think that whether it's housing navigation or whether it's other types of case management or perhaps um, engagement with um, uh, mental health services or substance use uh, supports, I think there are many different ways we might define that going forward. We're trying to just make sure that people are connected, which as you might recall, pre-pandemic was not a function of the GA motel voucher program. Can't hear I'm, getting you a I'm, I'm getting a t-shirt. I'm getting a t-shirt. Representative um, Redmond and Representative um, McFawn, and I don't see any other questions. I would like to suggest that after those two questions, we move on because it is 930 and I want to make sure that we actually hear the whole presentation. Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Commissioner and Jeffrey and, and crew. Um, question about um, the 30-day um, extension. Um, is there any limit on that extension? And going to kind of the point you alluded to before, what happens if you reach those capacity limits? What's kind of the, you know, and someone is really, um, you know, uh, eligible for this need. Um, what, what are, have you thought through kind of what that backstop is? Sure. So how we've, how we've approached that in the past, and, and it can look, you know, depending on the situation, um, it, we may, it could be a capacity issue in one district. And so we ask the family if they're able to, if we, you know, to help to locate to like, say if they're in St. Albans and we have a room a room for a family available in Burlington, if they are willing to, to go and we can put the, so that's the first layer of what we do. Um, and as Jeffrey indicated in the past, um, you know, we've really run into some capacity issues in the winter, particularly around some of the, the, the big holiday ski weekends. Um, and, and how we've approached that in the past as we, we were prepared ahead of time with providers to stand up pop up emergency extreme cold weather shelters so that if, if we ran out of motel rooms, we opened those up for the duration of the really cold weather event. And then normally what would happen is, is once the, the holiday weekend passed, um, capacity would free up a little bit and then we, we would be able to adjust that way. But um, we've certainly and it's and believe it or not, it's always certainly been timed around a holiday weekend. Um, Martin, the Martin Luther King weekend in January, President's Day in February. Have, uh, have we've ran into issues every year around those two holidays during the ski season, and so we will be prepared again there as well. And then also, you know, we try to, um, you know, many motels won't work with us, or um, but we do continue to call around when we get into a and just plead like we have one family we can you please work with us with this one household just for this duration until you know so there's a different strategies we use so uh, i think um representative mcfawn we're on to you okay thank you madam chair um commissioner last uh thanks for coming in this morning Last year, we put out millions of dollars to renovate existing units and um, though, and other buildings that were uh, not being used to kind of go in and renovate them and uh, to create housing units. And I know it hasn't been a long time since we put that money out, but it's been about a year. And um, I'm wondering if uh, that effort 
had any impact at all on this plan? Um, we did see the impact um, um, when some of those projects came online, Representative McFawn, um, like one of those initiatives. Um, well, some of it, 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 it impacts us negatively and it impacts us positively. And one way it can impact us negatively is some of those projects involve the purchase of hotels and converting them into permanent housing units. Um, and so we lose capa that capacity of that motel as an emergency housing resource. And when they build back permanent using the units, it's not a one for one room because sometimes they, they take multiple rooms to make one unit. Um, but for instance, Champlain Housing Trust purchased the Baymont up in the Essex Colchester area and converted that. And so when we um, saw that open, our numbers in the emergency housing program and some of the other uh, projects our numbers went down, but over time, they have gradually increased just given the long-term economic impact that the pandemic is having on households. You know, it continues to, to, to put pressure um, on families and individuals. And we, see, we still see households uh, becoming homeless as a result of that. And, and, and so you know, we did see the benefit, but now we're kind of back up to where, to where we were before that. So there was a dip and then it, it came back up. If I can also respond to Representative McFawn, I would say that um, what you're speaking to specifically is the rental rehabilitation program that our uh, partners at DHCD had, uh, Department of uh, Housing Community Development had um, stood up. And I think that um, the, the reality, that, to be frank, is that we need as much uh, housing as possible uh, in the current climate. So that may be um, some uh, turning motels into single room occupancy settings. It may be permanent supportive housing settings. It may be um, uh, permanent house, building permanent housing. It may also be uh, renovating old stock with the, with the rental rehab. I mean, I think we have often talked, uh, you've heard us say this many times uh, in, in testimony that there are three legs of the stool when we talk about homelessness and housing and security. There's um, uh, there's rental assistance, there's services, and there's housing stock. And I think we're at a point where we have more rental assistance and more services than we've ever had. Uh, and right now we need to use as many of those tools in our toolbox uh, to address permanent housing as possible, including that rental rehabilitation, but not limited to, because that is a, a, an important part. Thank you. Um, why don't uh, commissioner or uh, Jeffrey, uh, I guess you're going to move to talking about when people aren't eligible and those things. Yes, and I will have Jeffrey take the lead on on that piece, and and then Jessica as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, well, with regard to the period of ineligibility, um, there are historically um, the well, let me let, let me lay out. Sorry, uh, let me try that again and lay out first what we're proposing, which is that. Um, we're proposing a period of ineligibility um, to, uh, that would be two-tiered. So there would be major violations and lesser violations. A, a way to think about that is that these major violations uh, as laid out in the uh, proposal, things like violent criminal behavior uh, or attempted behavior, criminal behavior, uh, major theft, um, creating safety hazards like disarming smoke detectors or blocking exits, threatening guests or staff, these uh, sale and distribution of illegal substances, destruction of property, these sorts of things are um, uh, would be subject to a period of ineligibility. For your first offense, that would be 15 days and then 30 days for each subsequent offense afterwards. The second tier of violations are what folks are referring to as lesser violations. Um, these are essentially more in the line of nuisance um, or uh, behavioral issues. Uh, this is, in some ways, uh, comes from a harm reduction model. We don't need to be um, making people ineligible for 30 days because they were being loud you know, and annoying their, their neighbors or being disruptive. Um, so we're trying to have a, a much more uh, nuanced approach to something that was historically a blunt instrument. Um, 
So in those cases, there's lesser violations. There would be no period of ineligibility. However, motels do their private businesses and they still can exit a guest from a hotel. And the hotels and motels, um, there are clients who they, they choose not to um, rent to going forward. And so that could be a possibility. I'd like to point out that that period of ineligibility pre-pandemic was across the board 30 days. Um, additionally, we are, uh, something that was instituted during the pandemic that we are going to maintain is that the period of ineligibility will not apply to households with children. Uh, and that expanded definition of households with children, meaning uh, over the, uh, sorry, under the age of 18 or 19 and attending secondary school or the equivalent thereof, uh, which is again, a shift from pre-pandemic. The, uh, the other piece um, that the commissioner mentioned was the causing one's own loss of housing. Um, temporary housing is intended to provide a short-term shelter uh, for applicants who are involuntarily without housing due to circumstances that they could not have reasonably be avoided. Historically, the, uh, that ended up in a six-month period of ineligibility. Uh, and what, has, uh, what was reached during the, the conversations within the GA working group uh, was that that has been reduced from six months to three months. Um, so the department would house a client in a motel if they caused their own loss of housing uh, within the past three months. And causing one's own loss of housing, um, although it includes uh, leaving housing where one could have stayed, if a person's disability may have played a role in that, uh, then that's something that would be reconsidered and that process will be developed uh, that, and would include a review and decision by the ESD, the Economic Services Division Deputy Commissioner. Um, I think this is a point where, where um, our, our colleague Jessica Radbor would want to weigh in about um, their perspective perhaps. So Jessica, if you would like to uh, add your thoughts, that would be welcome. Actually, if it's okay, I have prepared remarks. So I'd rather hold off and just go through it all at once when, when you're done. Yep. Okay, um, and then um, moving on, as we indicated, um, you know, these new rules and programmatic changes would apply to new applicants on um, June 1st, and then everyone that's in, in at the end of May would continue to be eligible under the um, uh, pandemic program requirements um, through the end of June, on June 30th. Um, during that time, um, you know, we would be working with our housing partners who are um, working with many of the households and the motels now to help them reapply under the no, new rules so that effective July 1st, if they have continuing eligibility, they would continue to be eligible um, for uh, under the new program rules as proposed here. Um, the other uh, piece that I would point out um, is that we've historically operated um, in, the, in the winter months an adverse weather policy where we relax the rules and anyone who's eligible um, and who's homeless it, um, um, is able to come into the program and we will continue to do that this winter as well. Um, we don't uh, propose any, any shift from that policy in terms of uh, um, that. Um, uh, and then uh, the other thing I want to highlight, you know, the, the state emergency operations um, uh, worked closely with our program and was able to utilize FEMA funding and issue grants and contracts to providers across the state um, uh, to provide meal deliveries to all of the uh, households and the motels that will end July 1st, um, along with the state of, you know, as in, you know, if the state of emergency ends and that service would end, you know, our work group is continuing to look at that to see if uh, providers in the community can continue to have um, any other existing meal services connected to motels. Also, we're going to work with hotels to make sure that um, households have a place to heat food in a centralized area. Many hotels that, that don't have kitchenettes in their rooms um, do not allow heating appliances in their rooms due to fire safety hazard and code. And so we're gonna work with hotels to, if they, if they do not have that service in their rooms, that we, um, they have a centralized area where people could at least heat 
food and or prepare food if necessary. And so we'll work with motels there. But that that's something that that will happen as well. Um, the other point um, I would want to um, just touch on um, is uh, the the financing behind this plan. And I would turn to Sarah Truckle to, uh, to pull up um, you know the proposed budget and how we're going to fund this proposal, and then walk the committee um, committees through that, and then just highlight certainly some of the challenges of the funding sources that we're going to be using um, as, as we move forward this year. Uh, Commissioner, can can you and Sarah do that in no more than 15 minutes in order to uh, give um, Jessica time to uh, make her prepared remarks and then um, the committee to perhaps uh, make their questions or comments. Um, not yes. Sarah, not, not that we're not interested, Sarah, in money, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we can do, I, I believe we can do that easily in 15 minutes. Happy to do so. Um, Sarah Truckle, DCF Financial Director for the record. Can I get the ability to share a screen if you'd like to see the numbers up? Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so at the last page of our housing proposal plan, uh, we have a basic table that outlines the budget to move forward with this. Uh, so we are planning to spend just over $17 million in motel housing that is for non-adverse weather conditions and $12.5 million for motel costs during the adverse weather condition months. Um, the proposed funding sources behind that would be a mixture of FEMA and ERAP. Uh, ERAP is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, and we are currently leveraging FEMA funds for the motel costs at this point, um, with an anticipation that those will end at some point during SFY 22. Um, it should be noted, as, as Commissioner Brown indicated, that there are some uh, operational and fiscal challenges with using our ERAP funds for this purpose. Um, for example, uh, there is a time limitation on households receiving those funds. So uh, under the first ERAP bill, they're allowed to use funds for 12 months of rental assistance and um, up to three months, an additional three months for uh, retro back rent. Um, under those, those terms, um, if a household has already received the max allotment of the ERAP duration, then they would not be eligible to leverage those funds if they came into the GA program. So there's some limitations on that funding source um, in that way. Additionally, there's a requirement around income documentation as well as a signed application that has to be filled out that we're working through the logistics of operationalizing now. Um, so we're working on those components, but it will look a little bit different in order to leverage this fund source than it has historically. Additionally, uh, for motel-based services, we're looking at leveraging an additional $4 million above the current housing support services authorized under the first ERAP bill, um, and these would go out to our community partners. Additionally, we would use $650,000 of our existing coronavirus relief funds that exist within DCF in the housing, uh, for the housing plan originally uh, for motel-based security services. These CRF funds were authorized uh, as part of the original $16 million last year. Uh, some of them have been freed up by FEMA now being 100% covered uh, for motel-based services by the federal government rather than the 75% uh, Fed fund, 25% state match, which we were using CRF funds. And that happened in January under the Biden administration. Um, originally, we, or additionally, we will also use our base budget, those moves that you saw in the governor's FY22 proposed budget and shifting funding from the GA Dept ID to our OEO Dept ID. And that will expand community-based shelter and temporary and permanent um, options within OEO. Those will also go out the door using our state general fund dollars. Um, 
We will additionally have $4 million of coronavirus relief funds, of which $3 million we anticipate using for what we're calling essential support payments. These will be for payments um, for households who are exiting the motel system and to provide uh, funds for essential needs that they may have. We also um, plan to use a million dollar dollars for rapid resolution purposes. These funds are a little bit different in where uh, we pay for things like a deposit down on an apartment or a bus ticket or different types of services um, to promote permanent um, or rehousing of, of our clients. Uh, we also have additional funds for our 211 contract leveraging our CRF funds as well as uh, 2.25 million in ERAP funds for staffing needs in order to operationalize these plans with some of those logistics around using ERAP, uh, DCF will require an additional 17 new limited service positions uh, to work with these clients in getting all of those uh, different components as well as the reporting requirements for treasury for the ERAP funds themselves, uh, bringing us to a total budget need of 40.9 million of which uh, just under 5 million is our existing coronavirus relief funds that have already been appropriated to DCF. And, when I, and to just touch on the um, staffing needs, um, this program historically served on average 180 to 200 families um, at any one time across the state and, and, and ESD was staffed to manage a caseload of that size during the pandemic at group times 10 to almost 2000 families at, at its peak. Um, and we utilized FEMA funding to create 20 temp positions to, uh, to, to, to do that work. Um, we are now, and we've certainly had some challenges with those, they have hour limitations, and they also have, um, you know, they don't come with benefits, and, and, um, and so it was hard to recruit and retain those staff, and so we are looking to shift to um, limited service positions um, to help us do, do the work of this program. Um, next year, um, um, hoping that would create some stability in the staffing because um, we really do need to work closely with the households we're serving here to make sure we have all the documentation so um, that we can comply with the federal guidance of the use of the ERAP funding. A um, lot of, lot of um, compliance issues we need to worry about there with the federal government. We have a question from Representative Rosenquist, I believe either for um, Sarah Yu or uh, Sean Yu. This would be for Sarah and, and the commissioner possibly, but uh, I see this $40 million and you say the majority of it comes from special funds for the relief we're going through as far as the pandemic, whether it's Corona or wrap around whatever, ERAP and stuff. Uh, uh, so what happens in the future once those funds are exhausted? Uh, is this going to fall to our general fund to make up this uh, uh, $40 million or not? So part of the ongoing work um, based on the language in the House budget, which we want to continue to honor, um, is a, a plan to be submitted um, in November um, regarding what uh, the the, the program will look like in, in state fiscal year 23. So this just looks at 22, and then we will continue to work through the spring and the summer on a proposal of what 23 will look like, and that would include a funding proposal as well. And I think this ties back to, um, you know, if we're really going to um, end homelessness or significantly reduce it in the state, we know right now that, that the, the, one of the biggest pressures is the lack of units in affordable housing. And I go back to, we need more units and, and the governor's plan of, of the 5,500 units over the next several years, that is critical to, to our, our work in this area in really um, making sure Vermonters have a safe permanent place to stay. Um, it's just, we just need more units there and they just don't exist right now. Thank you, Commissioner. We have two questions and then I wanna stop, the, if I may, stop the questions in order that we can hear actually um, from legal aid who has uh, some alternative uh, views on some of this proposal. And I think it's important that we hear that as well. 
Um, we have two questions, one from um, Representative Cordes followed by Representative McFawn. Representative Cordes. Thank you. Uh, we've Addison County legislators heard recently from um, a, a program organized by United Way uh, that there were, in, in regards to housing, there are many barriers um, and there stands to be, I'm sure you already know, hundreds of people in the next few weeks um, that may lose their housing um, just in Addison County. Um, but one of the barriers they mentioned was um, matching uh, that service dollars have to be matched with housing dollars and that those have been siloed in the past. Is this addressed in um, the work you're showing here with um, ERAP? Yes. Making sure that the services can follow, um, that we have the capacity to make sure the services follow the people. You're exactly right, Representative Cordes. Um, this proposal um, uh, proposes four million to continue those services. Also, um, you know the base budget that that we're moving over to OEO. Um, it's around six million or six and a half million that that traditionally was spent on motels. Um, you know we're going to have available to support services and shelter work and and make sure we're following families because. Uh, you know, in our work, we we recognize that it doesn't stop once someone's permanently housed. That many households need ongoing support to maintain that housing for a period of time. And you know, when we want to ensure that um, we have enough service capacity across the state to do this work well. Thank I would, you. I would also add the four million here is in addition to the housing support services that have already been authorized and appropriated under ERAP, so um, there's already millions of dollars that have been authorized. Thank you. Um, am I up, Madam Chair? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner, um, as I read through the list of violations and so on, um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, we wanna keep the motels in the program as much as we can, we want to keep community-based shelters in the program, and we want to uh, keep landlords that are willing to take people with the vouchers in the program so that these people have some kind of housing. Now, my question is this. I looked at the, all the budgets. I, I don't see any line in there for repairs or maintenance. When destruction of property takes place, who's paying for that? Normally, I think what you're referring to, Representative McFawn, is uh, many of our service providers that we support in terms of services. Um, I, I, I'll, I would refer to it as a um, landlord liaison who work with landlords to, to try to keep them working um, with, with our programs and services. Um, and I would envision that some of our service dollars um, would be available uh, for that work and that we would encourage our providers. And when we put out our request for proposals, we can, you know, we could highlight that that's still an ongoing need and that's work that happens today. And, um, and it needs to continue on as well. So that uh, if, a, it, it, let's say, so if a room or a community shelter or something is damaged and can't be used um, to get it back up in line, and to keep those landlords that are willing to, to help, uh, that service money might be used to do the repairs so that the it can come back online. Yeah, that would be. Uh, we re, yeah, we've referred that into the past as, as like a risk pool, so, and you know, I think that was a part of our earlier housing plan um, um, last summer, when, um, which. Um, we weren't able to implement because the pandemic kept going, um, but that was some of the components that we recognized that there needed to be like a risk pool to help um, if in those situations that you just identified. And we want to make sure as we put out requests for services that they include that as well, Representative McFawn. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Thank you both. And uh, Jessica, please um, go ahead. And Sarah, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. For the record, my name is Jessica Radford, and I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. I've been serving as a member of the General Assistance Working Group. Um, our working group's task, as we understood it from the legislature, was to try to get to consensus on how to meet the needs of the most vulnerable Vermonters experiencing homelessness within the limits of the number of motel rooms and funding resources made available for that purpose. And for the most part, we did come to consensus on the proposal. But that consensus position relied very heavily on some critical assumptions, which have been challenged in recent days. And with the passage of time, the realities of the proposal altogether have come to loom even larger for a lot of the service providers who participated in the working group. I know that's true for me. Um, so I'm becoming ever more vigorous in my advocacy on some of the points that I'm gonna be making today. And apologies if I sound a little negative. So in my testimony today, um, I'm gonna to cover three things. The parts of the proposal where Vermont Legal Aid disagrees. Two, the working group's assumption that as GA residents in motels ran out of their 84 days, there would be 600 new permanent affordable housing units uh, coming online just for them. Uh, three, to share my very real fears of what will happen to our homeless neighbors as these new rules take effect, looking specifically to June 1, July 1, and September 22nd. So first I'll talk about the areas where Vermont Legal Aid disagrees. Um, one of them, Sean, uh, sorry, Commissioner Brown had noted earlier, and I'll discuss that in a moment, but the other thing that I wanted to talk about is actually a little bit of language in the budget. Um, specifically, the language that says, quote, the assistance provided under this section is not an entitlement. And I wanted to flag that this contradicts the statutory language for the GA program and is typically actually in the budget language only included in the language for community alternatives to GA, not in the GA motel program budget language. Um, Section 2103A of Title 33 provides that so long as there are appropriations available, the department quote, shall furnish GA benefits to eligible persons under the program rules. In other words, it operates like an entitlement for those who meet the eligibility criteria, so long as the program hasn't run out of money. So to be consistent with that statutory language and because as I always say, rights matter, um, I think the language in the budget bill and we're working on the rules right now. So uh, I have flagged this in our rules discussion. I think those should be revised. Um, and I'm happy to send language proposals if you would like to see those in writing. Um, I'd also like to note that regardless of appropriations, I think there is an argument that the department has a duty to ensure that all children and vulnerable adults are afforded basic shelter consistent with department's Title 33 un obligations under Chapter 49, which relates to child welfare, and Chapter 69, which is protection of vulnerable adults. Um, second thing, as noted in the proposal, Vermont Legal Aid also opposes the bar on eligibility for emergency housing for 90 days for any applicant who caused their own loss of housing. I've worked with individuals and families over the years who were denied GA under this rule, and I think it's bad policy and creates particularly adverse effects for children and people with disabilities. I've personally had the experience of having a child look me in the eye and beg me to help his family because he didn't want to sleep outside again and that child did nothing wrong. I met with a mom and a three month old baby who were in a tent last summer after being denied under the COVID era version of this rule. A baby needs to be able to take a bath and not be in a tent in the rain. There's at least one old fair hearing decision that supports the assertion that children have a right to GA regardless of their parents alleged fault for losing their housing. In that case, the human services board said Visiting the sins of the parents upon their children is a punitive result. The HSB's position was that, quote, there cannot be any more compelling societal interest than for homeless children to have safe and suitable temporary shelter. I agree. Or imagine a disabled senior on insulin who gets evicted for smoking in their non-smoking apartment. 
Under this proposal, that person would be in a tent or in their car for 90 days or until they end up in the hospital because they couldn't keep their insulin at the right temperature. I urge you to reject the 90 day bar on eligibility at the very least for families with children and for vulnerable adults. And my guess is that such a change would make a very negligible difference in the overall program budget and capacity in the motels. And I'm happy to provide suggestions for language. Next, I'd like to touch on the need for permanent affordable housing that our working group so heavily factored into our proposal. Other than for families with children and people with disabilities that significantly impair their activities of daily living, time limits on provision of assistance are reinstated under the proposal, the 84 days that we talked about. And when I looked back at the 2020 data for coordinated entry, it showed that it actually took 125 days in non-COVID times to get permanent housing and the situation is even worse now. The thing is when GA was created back in 1967, I think, um, it was designed as a short-term benefit to address emergencies, but things were so, it was a different world back then, right? Uh, even as a low wage worker or person on SSI, it was probably a lot easier to get an apartment. And we didn't have the incredibly low vacancy rates in the rental market that we have now. Even if we don't consider the affordability issue, there are simply not enough units to rent to meet the need that we confront. Um, there was an article in VT Digger just a few days ago um, that said that in December 2020, the vacancy rate in Chittenden County was just 1.1%. I had my support staff do a run through of all the ads on Craigslist a couple of months ago in Chittenden County. And even if you got a person in a GA motel into every single one of those units, you'd only reduce the GA motel population by 6%. That is mind blowing. Uh, a case manager in Lamoille told me earlier this year there was not one single rental unit available in all of Lamoille County that was under the fair market rents. Rental subsidies are useless if there's no place to go with them. And when apartments do appear on the private market, they tend to go really, really quickly and are most likely to get leased out to people who can pay right away, even with a Venmo, um, who don't need a landlord to do a bunch of special subsidy paperwork, and who don't have negative or non-existent rental histories. Last Thursday in our working group, we reviewed statistics from the Balance of State Homelessness Continuum of Care, um, their coordinated entry needs assessment of uh, homeless households, and the data was shocking, even for providers. I'll give you a little bit of a sample. So 26% of the people reported that they had never been named on a lease, ever. 38% had been homeless before they were 25. 48% had chronic medical conditions that are disabling. 53% reported having been to the emergency room at least once in the last year. 22% they had absolutely no income whatsoever, earned or unearned, for the last 12 months. It's true that some people in the motels are just low income, they need a subsidy, and a whole lot of luck trying to get an apartment in this market. But for many of the people in the motels with limited or no rental history, little to no stable income, serious health issues, renting in the private market is going to be very, very, very hard. There's just too much competition for the limited number of units available. So outside of low barrier affordable housing providers, I just don't see a good exit strategy for the people that we have in the motels right now. Our working group, when we were looking at how long are people gonna be able to stay, was relying really heavily on our belief that we'd have those 600 new units of rapid permanent housing for the homeless um, as outlined in the governor's ARPA proposal. And it's our understanding that the housing working group also supports that allocation of funding to develop those units and I think they're offering testimony right now in House General. But here's the thing, I do think that the Senate and some other legislators have raised pretty reasonable concerns about the proposal to use $90 million to create 600 units of permanently affordable housing restricted to people experiencing homelessness. So I just wanna go over a few of the things now. So I'm not a housing developer uh, and I can't speak to exactly how many rental units you would get out of $90 million but I just don't see the prospect of falling short of 600 units as a reason to hold back funding until 2022 or some later date. I don't wanna see a single feasible proposal to create permanent housing for the people we have in motels turned down simply because we don't have the money. And as of yesterday, the treasury had yet to release guidance detailing eligible uses for the coronavirus state and local recovery fund. So maybe the best policy is to do a mix of 
general fund and, and ARPA, I don't, I don't know. Um, either way, I just see an immediate need for that housing to be developed using whatever funding is available. Same thing for leveraging tax credits. I understand from the folks who know more about this stuff that leveraging tax credits can take longer when it comes to development. And again, I just see the need for immediate housing now, whatever we need to do. I also understand concerns around creation of housing that segregates people with a history of homelessness. Again, right now we have a crisis, we're running out of time, we're gonna lose this motel space and hundreds of people have nowhere to go. So I think it's essential to focus on rapid development of housing for people exiting GA. And I don't think that properties that house solely people exiting homelessness are doomed to failure. If you attach the right services and the right supports, I think the tenants can be successful and the properties can be safe. And over time, they'll become more diverse. I do have concerns um, about service capacity. Uh, and I think, you know, we've seen gaps in services at the motel, specifically for people with serious mental health issues or substance use disorder. So filling in those gaps is gonna be really important. The households in the J motels need an exit strategy. I know my clients, have been feeling really hopeless for an awfully long time and now they know that time is running out and there's nowhere to go. So rapid development of housing for people experiencing homelessness is a critical and immediate need and we can't delay. We need massive investment now. And finally, <laughs> I offer a grim dose of reality. So let's talk about those, those timelines, right? There are three dates that are weighing heavily upon me and, and I think they're weighing on the other service providers in the working group too. And that's June 1, when the new eligibility rules kick in, um, July 1, when the current GA residents um, might start becoming ineligible, and September 22nd, when a lot of the current residents 84 days of eligibility under the new rules are gonna lapse. Okay, so June 1. I have a client right now who got a notice to quit for no cause <clears throat> because her landlord wants to sell the property where she lives. And she just can't find another place to go. She's got a low wage job, she does work full time, but there are almost no vacancies. And she's scared to death she's not gonna find a place. Come June 1, people like her, who are getting evicted for no cause or for sale of the property, are gonna qualify for nothing unless they meet one of the vulnerable criteria that we identified. And it's really hard to get a new home or keep your job when you're living in your car. Okay, fast forward to July 1, when the new eligibility rules kick in for current GA motel residents. I've worked with youth who came out of foster care, who in spite of being able-bodied enough to work, had experienced so much trauma that they could barely look anyone in the eye and so much anxiety that it's hard for them to be around other people. But they don't have a documented disability and they don't have a doctor who can talk about their mental health challenges. And as of June 1, I do worry that under our new program rules, Kids like that are gonna be terminated from GA, even if they have nowhere to go. And what's gonna happen on September 22nd for all the people granted under the new vulnerable eligibility criteria, if they have yet to secure housing, they are going to be out of time. And I have a very real fear that with or without the $90 million of funding, we won't see 600 units ready for occupancy by September 22nd. Maybe we'll never see that many units with the current market conditions. And we'll see hundreds of people with disabilities, seniors, domestic violence survivors, and pregnant women being exited from the motels with no permanent housing lined up. Uh, and the proposal would give them some cash, but cash is in a home. So pandemic or not, I wish housing would always be seen as necessary for health and basic human dignity, and that investments would be made accordingly. And that would have gone back for decades prior to now. Um, and that rules would be designed with nothing more than public health and safety in mind. And as a legal aid attorney, I see housing and shelter as a, as a basic human right. But that's not what we have in the proposal uh, because limited resources, we're out of motel space. And it's hard to sit with that because when you really get to know the people in the motels and when you really listen to their stories, it's really hard to place blame on them or to turn your back on their predicament. And I can tell you that over the years, Every time I work with someone who isn't able to access emergency housing or shelter, and I tell them they aren't eligible under the rules or that they were eligible, but they're out of time and there's nothing within the law that I can do to help them, it really makes your soul die a little. Because these are our neighbors and they matter and their health and safety matter. 
So I hope you will consider supporting the changes I suggested for you today and to support investing in rapid housing development for people experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jessica, thank you. And I hope that you will, um, I did not see previously your remarks um, submitted, if you could submit it both to um, uh, House Healthcare as well as Health hum Human Services, we would appreciate that. Um, before I open it up to questions, just to, uh, a little clarification. Um, in are you speaking solely um, for legal aid or are there, okay, you're speaking solely for legal aid in terms solely of- Solely for legal aid, yes. In terms of your, your newest, um, the, the additional concerns or questions that you have about the proposal, um, because as it was presented, it seemed like the working group of which you were a member were, except for the piece about 90 days, were at one point thought this was okay. I'm not saying that even I am saying it's not, a, I just needed to highlight there are a number of assumptions that we relied on. And in the last okay. few days, we're thinking maybe we rel overly relied on that. So I'm not saying pull the plug on it. I just okay. need to flag the things that the realities of where we're at now. Okay. And, and I and in, in our conversations with our partners in the work group, I would concur with Jesse. You know, like there's palpable concern from our the working group members regarding the the lack of long term investment um, in line with the governor's proposal, and that that was a key component as this plan was developed, and that's really giving mm -hmm. a lot of the members pause right now. That that mm -hmm. it re they really do work together closely. And without that investment, they're really concerned about what happens next, mm -hmm. as, as we are as well. And there, um, I guess, uh, my question, Commissioner, to you and to you, Jessica, um, was what was pointed out is that the, um, for lack of a better term, the, the right to housing um, uh, is being removed and being um, that no longer it sounds like no longer is that or the, the, the ability you know, to be housed based on money available used to be a responsibility of the state and that's being removed. Is that what you were saying, Jessica? That's so the, being passed the, on to the, to the community and the state is taking, saying it's now community, your role. No, not exactly. So okay. in in the GA statute, which right. is separate from the, but there's still the same language, right? Which says the department, it's just concerning to me. And I, I fully admit, I had not as vigorously advocated for this before, but it's come to bother me a lot. And so I'm flagging it now that in the budget item, there's language saying this isn't an entitlement, uh, which I think is not accurate. And it's not been in the um, budget language, at least last year, it wasn't in the budget language in that exact place. It only applied to the community-based providers, not to GA. So okay. I, I've got some language that I can put okay. in here. Yeah, I, Thank you. Yeah, I, if I could, may jump in here, I think what Jessica is referring to is I think she strongly believes that Vermont should be uh, a state that there's a, a fundamental right to housing. And, and I think the language she's referring to it in the GA statutes, there's language there. that refers to that, you know, basically this service exists until the money runs out, that it's not right. So, and so, so we're not changing that. I think the language just recognizes what's been in statute all along. And, and it's well, just, yeah. Good to hear that you're not changing it. Mm -hmm. um, we can just make sure that mm -hmm. you have no intention to change it. Um, it sounds like there may be some individuals who think the language proposed does change it. So maybe we'll look at different language. Um, but I've stopped talking now. I wanna open it up for uh, questions for anyone from um, House Healthcare and House Human Services. Representative Chena. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I I've been listening and digesting all of this information and. And just thinking about, um, you know, how how 
what policy do, do these committees need to support moving out of the pandemic to make sure we take care of people? And um, I've heard talk about investing money in the development of new units of housing. And in the policy behind that investment, I guess my question is, are, is, that, is anyone thinking about how, you know, if we give the money to existing landowners to build more housing, that the state is taking public money and investing it in a way that allows people who already have wealth to accumulate more wealth while providing housing, which is a right, should be a right for people. Have, has there been any thought about ways that we might invest that money into forms of housing in which the residents can build equity, like cooperative housing, for example? Like I haven't heard that, that specifically mentioned, but it is a policy decision because if, if, if we choose to make a policy decision that we're gonna give money to developers to develop more property, then we're basically saying that the money of the state is we're investing it into people who are accumulating wealth while providing a service for the state but if but we could be investing that money in a way that actually uh, builds the wealth of the people to whom we're providing the service then we could uh, we could lift people out of poverty and so i guess i'm just asking is there any this any uh, any like to our witnesses is there any has there been any talk of this do you have any ideas about how we might do that you know how we might use the money um, in ways like that so I think uh, exactly what you're you know, the point you're making. There's another work group testifying, as Jessica indicated, right now before General Housing and Military Affairs, and that was the work group tasked with developing those longer-term permanent housing strategies. That includes representatives from the Vermont State Housing Authority, the Vermont Conservation Housing Board, in terms of and their processes that they go through to to um, you know request proposals. Um, uh, for those type of projects and they encourage, and I know they encourage creativity and I would encourage these committees if you want to hear more on their work that I'm sure those members would come in and testify as well because that's really their lane of work right now, Representative Cena, as they've been focusing, I think, on those exact areas you just raised. And I can just add in the, for the rapid permanent housing for the homeless um, and expediting affordable housing mixed income housing pipeline that was in the ARPA proposal from the administration, that would be money going to affordable housing developers. So they're nonprofits who typically are charging below market rates um, for lower income folks. And specifically for the uh, rapid permanent housing for the homeless, it would have to be someone who's homeless right now. There was some funding for the VHIP proposal in the ARPA budget. Um, and that would be funding that would go to private landlords. But the last time I took a look at the bill language on that, which is S79, um, there were like two different streams for it. And I think I might get this a little wrong. One of them was they were required to take, so it's a private landlord, they're getting some money to rehab a unit and they were required to take someone off of the coordinated entry list. Those are the people experiencing homelessness and keep the unit affordable for I believe five years. Or there was another option of taking someone who was uh, I believe below 80% AMI, but they had to keep the unit affordable for 10 years. And there was also in the ARPA proposal, the home builder program um, which was try to meet that missing middle to get to a home ownership. Um, I think there are lots of other ideas too, right? There's 85 vacant mobile home lots across the state. And so maybe we could fill those up with mobile homes for people experiencing homelessness or other low income folks. Just an idea. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you for the question. Um, clearly housing is something that impacts not just sort of human services, but also health care. <clears throat> also, um, how do we fund it, appropriations, and um, how do we ensure um, that it gets built and things like that, which is sort of house general and military affairs. We are right here. Our two committees are hearing the proposal that is in um, the budget for a reason, a reason is because of the intersection around these um, pieces. And I believe that, you're, uh, that um, both of our committees are aware that there is going to be a small work group of two members from each of human services and healthcare and house general and military affairs and um, appropriations to look at the budget language. And we are focusing today on the um, proposal that is in the budget, 
not in um, other bills that House General and other committees are looking at. Um, I was going to say, Representative Pippinger, <laughs> Jeff, um, uh, Jeffrey, uh, you're going to say something, and then um, we have a question from uh, Representative Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, to uh, to reiterate, I think part of the point um, you were just talking about. I just wanted to remind folks that uh, contextualizing what we're talking about here, which is um, this specifically is a proposal around the GA motel voucher program. Right. What does the program of last resort in the state look like for people experiencing <laughs> homelessness and housing insecurity? That's a different but related question than how do we end homelessness in Vermont? Uh, the two are inextricably linked. But um, you know, this piece of it really is about how do we create a, um, a supportive program of last resort going forward that's also connected to these other pieces. You know, whereas prior to the pandemic, it was really isolated and disconnected from a lot of the system of care, uh, which is why there are two working groups, which is also why throughout the pandemic, we've been working with community partners as well as folks in the agency of uh, commerce and community development to ensure that we're thinking about this in a more holistic way. But it's, it's hard to kind of like bring it back down, right? When we're, when we have these massive concerns because we're, you know, people who uh, care about people, right? In the work that we do every day. And also we're looking at a very finite slice in this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. And we have five minutes and we have two questions. So I say that both to the people who have questions and to the people who are responding because um, we have five minutes total. Representative um, Whitman, um, and then Representative um, Barrows. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, I had just one concern that I wanted to flag. Uh, Commissioner Brown mentioned that meal deliveries would end on July 1st, and I just wanted to check if there is any uh, process to ensure that uh, households with children would continue to get summer meals uh, delivered to their motels and that's the there's a couple ongoing um, policy areas um, representative Whitman that our working group um, is going to focus on and that we have some um, takeaways um, to focus on um, Jessica highlighted one of those you know uh, substance abuse and mental health supports is an ongoing area we, we we continue to work on and I think the meals is the other and so we will work with you know, our partners, we're very connected with AOE right now in the pandemic EBT and the, and the delivery of school meals and that work will continue and that we coordinate that very closely with our education partners. And so we, that, that's going to be a focus of ours moving forward and we'll, we will connect with AOE just to ensure um, how that program is going to look moving forward through the summer for these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Pugh, and thank you to everyone who presented this morning. Um, my question is for Commissioner Brown. Um, in the very beginning of your presentation, um, you said that this was that uh, this was a two-phased um, uh, plan, and then it seems like you only presented one phase. Is the second phase what the work group is going to be working on in November? Yes, that that what uh, pro, the legislative language that came out of the house pro, out of the house asked us to uh, focus immediately on what twenty two would look like, and then to continue to work and submit a proposal. I believe on November first or sometime in November on what uh, for twenty three, so that the legislature would have time to digest it uh, for next session. Um, and what what do you think will be entailed in that dialing back some of the plan for um, 22 or? Um... Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't know because the work group hasn't started those conversations. Um, I think that there's so many factors that could implicate uh, that right now. Um, one thing I would highlight for the committee um, is, you know, we're a lot, this proposal, you know, um, and with the working group, you know, would lock us in for 22. And we, would, we wouldn't restrict conditions. If this would be what the program would look like in 22. 
with the one caveat that we are still, you know, that we're at, at the mercy of the pandemic. And if th there was a spike or something changed and we went back into a state of emergency, we would look to respond to that similar to what we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but also I think what we'd want to look at is what units are coming online, what uh, additional capacity is being built for permanent housing, how quickly is it coming online. We might not propose any changes. We might, as we did here from the, you know, this is a, a, a this program is going to look much different than the old program did pandemic in terms of um, the length of eligibility for in categories for folks. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you as a commissioner, I always pre pandemic had some real concerns at some of the categories and, and the limited service available and I feel much better um, with these new categories and lengths of stay. Um, for, particularly for families with kids and, um, and folks with a disability. I feel like we've made some improvements in the program. And so I think, you know, we would take all of that information to the work group. And just as we did with this plan, we didn't go in with any, any you know, we really worked together really well in that process. I think came out with a product that overall everyone supported, except for that one area that I think Jessica highlighted regarding the causing loss of housingness. And so my hope is, is that we will bring a, another consensus plan for what 23 looks like to the committee, but I wouldn't venture a guess of what that will look like right now because there's so many factors. Is there a, just very quickly as a, as a, a secondary indulgence, um, to what degree have, have, does this plan take into account the moratorium on evictions? And it's end, especially with this um, Supreme Court decision yesterday. Um, you know, I think that's one of the other factors um, that was, it wasn't a direct um, factor in the work of this work group. And I would let Jessica jump in here too. Um, but I think, you know, um, we're concerned about the end of that moratorium. Um, but I would say for those um, who are, at risk of eviction for non-payment of rent, there is a significant amount of financial resources available. And our work would be first to make sure that everyone who's facing eviction due to non-payment of rent has access and in, in in, we support them accessing those rental dollars to keep them in that permanent housing in their apartment. Because we don't want, because of the, you know, the impact that losing your housing has on households, and so our goal is, is to make sure if we become aware of those households that we keep them in that housing and that some of the work our service providers will do with some of the dollars that we're the service dollars that we're providing in this plan. I'm actually giving a training at 11 today to service providers talking about how are people losing housing during the eviction moratorium and VRAP is one of the things that I'm going to be talking about to use those funds to keep people in place. I did when I was giving my sort of stories of the people who are going to get left out. Um, I did flag that I have a concern for the folks who are going to um, get no caused or, or evicted due to sale of property. That's happening a lot. Uh, so so we're, we're a little nervous about that. If the people meet the um, eligibility criteria for vulnerable, you know, families with kids, people with disabilities, they'll be fine. But there are going to be some folks where property sold and they just can't find something else. You know, there's nothing. So thank you, and we look forward to sort of seeing that in writing so we can digest uh, some of the questions or concerns that you have so that um, each of us individually can sort of look at those and then at the same time uh, channel our uh, questions or concerns to our respective um, work groups or chairs. Um, Clearly housing um, as, we're, as it relates to homelessness and um, Jeffrey, thank you for the way that you um, honed in on really what we are talking about here in terms of this proposal. Um, and Representative Lippert, do you wanted to say anything before we uh, wrap up for the morning? No, just I, re <clears throat> I really appreciate being able to have our full committee as well as those representing our committee on the subgroup be able to hear and share in this presentation. It, it further illuminates the connections uh, between the work of our two committees. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
thank you very much. I think we're um, going to take a pause and our respective committees will go back to our respective rooms. And um, House uh, Human Services, I will see you back at 1045. And you, House Healthcare will convene at 11. <laughs>